Welcome to Feminist Buzzkills, the show that is terrified about climate change, but praying for climate change in our uteruses. I'm Liz Winstead, and I'm joined by my co-host, Moji Alawodeo, who would also like some climate change in her uterus. Always. I would love a low, low climate change there. Uh, have we hit the boundaries yet uh, of my uterus? Mm, I'm not sure. Well, maybe this... I'll build a wall or something. <laughs> This episode is an infosplosion of news you need to know. Over in Kansas, yet the same Kansas that voted to protect abortion access in a landslide, the anti-abortion Babadooks are trying to push four different abortion restrictions that are laughably terrifying. And we will terrifyingly laugh at each and every one of them and wait till you hear from their own mouth holes the fact-free fan fiction they have based this legislation on. Plus, as states are pushing for even crueler bans, patients are pushing back. And we'll fill you in on lawsuits being filed in Tennessee, Idaho, and Oklahoma from women who almost lost their lives because of their state's cruel abortion restrictions. And our guest is Barry Lynn, a man who has dedicated his life to reproductive justice, social justice, and fighting for an America free from religious persecution. His new memoir, Paid to Piss People Off, is out now, and we're going to talk about how cool that job is. Hey, Moj. Hey, Liz, how are you? I am so good. Oh, we had the best one of our best events ever, which I know you've attended. Um, every year we do this amazing show where we get righteous feminists who like sing the most sexist songs ever. And during the before times, uh, we did it live and then COVID happened and we did it on tape. And here in Minneapolis, some of the most righteous feminist musicians um, blew the walls off of the Parkway Theater here and sang the creepiest songs ever. And I mean, some highlights were, um, uh, what is it? Uh, Face Down, Ass Up uh, by Two Live Crew. Uh, was <laughs> Deller. Mm. Um, She's a Lady by Tom Jones. Um, mm. Wives and Lovers, always favorite. It was amazing. And I, the crowd went mental. I love Dory Me Too because it really is one of those moments where you're like, oh, we're just swimming in the waters of misogyny and patriarchy, just breathing the air and not even noticing it. And then we have Do Re Me Too. And it's like, oh, just so you know, that's what we're singing along to joyfully. And that's how pop culture is defining women. And everybody is just basically, you know, these vessels for, you know, to put your dick in. So and it looked like such a, such a good night. It was fun. And we raised 20 grand. Uh, which will all go to help abortion access. And that was really great. Very exciting. Oh, that sounds so cool. I wish I was there, but it was not in New York. It was not in New York. It was here. It's always nice to <laughs> open up the show with a little bit of positivity and watching, you know, 350 people screaming how much they support abortion, throwing their money towards it, and then signing up to volunteer. So it was a one, two, three. And you know what we don't need to do in our movement? Rebrand it. Because that is no. the thing I'm obsessed with <laughs> this week. Rolling Stone's amazing article about, about Republicans thinking their problem is the name pro-life. That's what people aren't connecting to. It's being like, we are pro-life. It's about life. We're life, life, life. And now when they actually see some of their policies enacted on a large scale, they're like, mm, maybe we need a different name. I know, but then they're throwing out names that are like, First of all, we know they're not pro-life because they're, you know, separating families and not giving people health care and veto every single expansion of Medicaid, Medicare, stuff for the elderly, stuff for, you know, families who are in need, um, schools, anything. But then they want to change it to pro-baby. Yeah. And it's like, who isn't pro-baby? Everyone's pro-baby. It doesn't really separate you out and from the pack. Pro-fetus doesn't have the same sort of snap, but it's a little more accurate. Well, it is exactly accurate but they don't want to say that because they realize that that's exactly who they are <laughs> to the exclusion of all other living things everything else <laughs> we celebrate the fetus so uh good luck with your rebrand maybe donnie deutsch is available to help you out with some of that or go on shark tank and figure it out it is wild but um that's not the only news that was this week there was so much news that happened and as always 
we're going to turn it over to our friend, Alyssa, who's going to drop the steaming pile of this week's news on us. Hey, friends. Glad to be hey, back. You sound so good. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we've, we've got the fancy mic. So, it, boom, it's a mic. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Welcome back. It's your weekly steaming news dump, or as I like to call it, an enema of the state of abortion. (laughs) The town of Chandler, Texas, has voted down a proposal to make their city a quote unquote sanctuary city for the unborn. Barf. Had it passed, it would have been illegal to even drive through the town to help someone get an abortion. Mm. But since it failed, all the kids getting knocked up knocking boots in their Ford F-150 can still drive straight through the whole town of Chandler, out of Texas, and into Arkansas, where they can't get an abortion. And then out of Arkansas and into Missouri, where they also can't get an abortion. And then out of Missouri and all the way up to Illinois, to have an abortion, they'll have to wait weeks to get an appointment for. Hey. A win's a win. This next story will make your heart as warm as when we found out Scalia was out cold forever. Governor Gavin Newsom is set to sign a bill that protects California providers who offer abortion and gender-affirming care so they can treat patients from states that ban these services like Oklahoma or Kentucky without prosecution. When Mitch McConnell was asked for comment... Alyssa, do you need to go back to your office? And come Monday, Planned Parenthood will resume abortion services in Wisconsin. Thanks to a ruling from a judge that said that a dusty, crusty, 174-year-old law widely interpreted as a near-total abortion ban actually doesn't apply to abortions at all. Finally, Wisconsin finds a judge that doesn't think it's the best idea to have your medical policy dictated by a statute written at a time when they thought getting on a moving train could make your uterus fly out of your body. That's been your steaming news dump. Back to you. Um, That's really exciting news about Wisconsin. I'm super, super excited for them. Thanks, Alyssa. Thanks. Let's get to our big stories. We got a lot to do, huh? Mm -hmm. Liz, you ready to take us to Kansas? I mean, who's, isn't everyone always ready to go to Kansas? I am. Yeah, we're not in Kansas anymore, but we should be. I know. Ballot initiatives awesome. Like in Kansas. When the people decided to put a guaranteed right to abortion on the ballot so voters could decide if they wanted abortion enshrined as a right in their state. And what was really great was when it passed in a 20 point landslide with huge voter turnout, the issue was settled once and for all. So great. Uh huh. Uh, JK, from the moment the people voted, the legislature has done nothing but pass anti-abortion measures. The governor vetoed them. And this week, their veto-proof majority in the legislature just voted to overturn four of them, each one nuttier than the next. The Senate also has a majority, so it is all but certain that they will override the governor's sanity and these laws will go into effect. So let's take off these four bills. Moji, take it Uh, away. Each override vote passed across party lines, basically in a 85-39 split, give or take, which are wild numbers. I guess it's what we call a supermajority. And that's what we call the people simply don't understand that their elected officials are creating bills that are against their interests because they voted overwhelmingly to keep abortion. But I digress. And they also seem to have voted to keep these elected officials. Yes. <laughs> so the first bill is the Women's Right to Know Act. And it is about one of my near and dear um, things, abortion reversal. That's right. They've been trying to pass this uh, forever, since 2019. And it passed and the governor vetoed it. And it's passed again. And this basically requires notification to patients that the effects of medication abortion, and that's basically... After you've taken mifepristone, uh, the effects may be reversible. This is not true. This is false. And it also revises the definition of abortion to clarify procedures that excluded from such definition. And that probably is the life-saving things that people need that are abortions that they don't want to call abortions. And this also requires private offices, freestanding outpatient surgical clinics, basically anywhere where a person can get a medication abortion to post up signs with these lies in the waiting rooms and patient consultation rooms or anywhere a patient would be to essentially say uh, medication abortion can be reversed. Liz, I don't want to read the whole bill. No, I don't. don't. I mean, it's okay. like, it's basically they're forced <laughs> to plaster signs everywhere that say, hey, if you've taken that first pill, 
ask your doctor about this thing that's horrible. Like forcing doctors also to lie to patients to say, you can go try this thing someplace. And also, I don't know if it's going to force these providers to do this procedure. Oh, goodness. But that would be insane because think about it. If your doctor's like, I'm forced to tell you that you can reverse your abortion, but I personally won't do it because it's unethical. What kind of message is that sending (laughs) to a patient? It's a mess. No, it's it's fully a mess. Also, this just, you know, we think about all the ways that like fake clinics are allowed to cosplay as doctors and they don't have to post that they're not a medical clinic, but actual doctors are forced to post quackery is just a full miscarriage of justice that I don't even, to a scale that is, it's just hard for me to believe that I'm living in this world right now. Well, also mentioning fake clinics, of course, the second piece of legislation here is that they voted to fund fake clinics. Uh, The governor vetoed funding fake clinics, but they vote to override the veto. And what the funding is, is funding uh, 50 CPCs, fake clinics, with additional funds outside of the um, existing. So it's upping the funding that they already have. And there would be an RFP that would oversee the funds to, quote unquote, see how they're spent. So all these fake clinics and quacks can just write these like exaggerated things of how they're going to spend the money. Right. Which is in their pockets or in fully unfathomable ways that we don't have any idea what they're doing with it. Yeah. Um, And then what my favorite thing is though, is um, one of the people that was one of the authors of this bill said, healthcare is more than abortion. So we're going to fund other healthcare. And it's like, if you're not funding abortion and you're funding fake clinics, you're not funding any health care at you're all. You're funding no health care. Provide health care. <laughs> funding no health care. And I can't believe it. Um, well, and the messy thing about this bill is that it was originally a standalone bill, but during the committee hearing, they made the decision to scrap it and then add it to the governor's budget bill as a line item. And when you do that, that means it stops the debating of a bill on its merits. So people couldn't bring up the fact that CPCs are fake, that they lie to their patients, that they're dangerous and harmful. And so once you shove that into a health care. Yeah. So once you shove it into a budget bill, it stops all conversation And then it just goes on the vote, which really is a sneaky way to do a lot of a lot of shit. And a lot of abortion bills end up in budget bills for that very reason. So a lot of this shit is the same old bullshit you've heard. But this one was new even for us. It's called the Healthcare Provider Insurance Availability Act. So what happened, you know, again, do we need to say governor vetoed it? Legislature just overrode it. We'll see what the Senate does. So in this one. Back in the 70s, the Kansas legislature passed a law that said every doctor in the state had to pay into a fund that would be used for physicians who were having a hard time getting liability coverage in their practice. Uh, They created it as a way to sort of lure doctors into Kansas. It's a way to help doctors who are in highly specialized uh, medicine like OBGYNs, orthopods, uh, people who have really high insurance premiums, this is a way to help them cover their liability costs, right? So the fund, they said, yes, you can have this fund. They don't pay into the fund. Doctors are required to pay into the fund. Every doctor in the state of Kansas has to pay into the fund. Well, here's what their bill says. It says abortion providers are like all doctors and required to pay into the fund, but they are not allowed to buy into the liability insurance package because they want to amend the definition of healthcare provider and says that facilities where elective abortions are performed are not healthcare. So they're providers. just disregarding years and years of med school and residency. And they're saying what you do is not what you do. What we say you do as non-doctors is in fact what you do. And therefore you cannot have doctor's liability, but you can pay into the fund. Yeah. And just to, re- just to say again, it's not a taxpayer fund. It is a fee based fund and doctors pay into it 
every year as a requirement of practicing in Kansas. So that is some bullshit. Forcing somebody to pay into a fund that they can never actually access the funds. Sounds like theft. It sounds like theft. It sounds like theft. And also when you bring in the taxpayer part, I want to remind, I just want to say like, also, even if taxpayers were paying for it, like who goes to abortion providers in their state? Taxpayers generally, right? Yeah, for the most part. Also, (laughs) how do you get to redefine healthcare provider? Is that a thing a state can do? Apparently, you don't provide health care. I guess it is. It's a mess. It's a mess. Yes. What's the final bill? The final. uh, Oh, oh my God. The final bill is the chestnut that anti-abortion zealots bring up in every state on a federal level. And it's one of the big, big bullshitty things that people hear and get scared and that People go, oh, I guess we have to ban that. And of course, we're talking about the Born Alive Act. Now, this, of course, same deal, passed the House, governor vetoed, they voted to override the veto, and this bill would require any premature baby born alive to be treated or transferred to another medical facility to try to keep the baby alive. Now, this already happens when there is a chance to save the baby. The only time people do not do this kind of thing is if palliative care is uh, required because there is no chance of the infant surviving, just like they do with anyone who is born alive. That is, everyone walking the earth was born alive. Um, They either treat you to keep you alive or treat you palliatively so that you aren't suffering. That already happens. Now, what this means is any infant born alive would have to be rushed someplace that would possibly put a baby that would not be able to survive onto life support that the family would have to pay for. Um, So think about like rural families um, who have to do that with a chance that maybe the infant would die en route you know, instead of having them be able to spend precious moments. Yeah. Um, it is not considering at all. It was like, do you remember back, Moji, um, when they were trying to pass Obamacare and they talked about the death panels? Uh-huh. And what the yes. death panels were was giving people funding within Obamacare to be able to pay for hospice care, palliative end-of-life care. That isn't covered. You know, my sister had ALS. And when it was revealed that there is no treatment for ALS, by the way, if you didn't know that, now you know. And it costs any family around $200,000 to $500,000 out of your own pocket because it's not medical care that you're providing. It's machines to help people stay alive. It's 24-hour care. It's um, comfort care. I was going to say it's pain management, pain management, yeah. all of those things. Yeah. And that's what the death panels wanted to cover. And so the palliative care here, that's exactly what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, with, with newborns. With newborns that they say they don't, they don't want that. They want to hook people up to machines, do anything they can to prolong a baby's life when the baby won't live at the cost of the parent and at the pain and expense of the family. And the I was going to say, I feel like a lot of times this will particularly hurt people who know that their pregnancy will not end with, you know, a child compatible with life and who just want to spend their last moments, like wrapped up with it and just kind of enjoying, you know, the last couple moments of the first and last moments of, of said child's uh, life. And yeah. basically though, that'll just be ripped out of their arms rushed into a NICU and possibly, you know, a lot of interventions that will most likely not sustain life. It's really distressing. Yeah. And one of the co-sponsors of this bill is some kind of doctor. I Googled and Googled and Googled and I could not find out what kind of a doctor. He His probably fits under whatever the new definition is in Kansas. Oh, yeah. Or He's, yeah. You know, uh, yeah, maybe that's the whole thing. In Kansas, we're redefining healthcare provider to mean State Him. legislator. Exactly. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <clears throat> so he made so many 
wild assertions in this Facebook post about sponsoring this bill that we need an abort, abort, abort breakdown on what he said. So we're going to just lay out the banana pants in what he said. And then we're going to just stop it when we need to and have a little discussion. So let's play the first of three uh, reasons that he co-sponsored the born alive bill. When the abortionist delivers a live baby, they have three, uh, three choices. One of them is to provide care for the new baby and uh, they risk potentially being sued for wrongful life by the mother. Abort, 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 abort. Okay, well, there's a lot to unpack here. I just want to start with uh, Kansas doesn't have a wrongful life lawsuit. They actually banned those as a part of- What is it? (laughs) So a wrongful lawsuit historically, and in some states they still exist, it basically is a, a suit brought by, they say a child, but obviously a child's parent, that um, either something happened in the circumstances of the birth or there was an abnormality that the the gestating parents did not know and would have maybe terminated had they known, right? That's generally how a, law, a wrongful life suit works. Um, but his assertion that like a botched abortion that ends in a life is a wrongful life suit, A, is like ridiculous. Like that doesn't even happen, Right. No one aborts live babies. It's called infanticide and it's illegal. But also Kansas Supreme Court decided in 2021, that's not even, that's just two years ago, 2021, that wrongful life suits were not allowed according to the constitution of Kansas. So the fact that he would bring this up as a Kansas politician is just really misleading and wrong. But also I just have to say, if you are needing an abortion, in a gestational window that says you could possibly give birth otherwise to a living fetus. That's not how those abortions work. Nobody is saying, good luck. I'm going to just take a fetus out of a body and then set it down and let it die. That's that called is not decide. happening. Be clear on how abortions that happen at a later gestational age, work, sir. Then it just keeps getting worse. Second is, if the baby is very premature, they set them aside and hope that they die quickly so that the problem is taken care of. The uh, third... Uh, 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 abort, 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 abort. So they do what? If, if a baby is premature, they set it aside and wait for it to die? What, they set it aside? Like it's their, like it's. What hospitals has he been in where they're setting aside premature babies? And waiting for them to die. Zero places. Zero. Not a single place. That's not a thing. Also, no. infanticide. Also, if he knows this, speak up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then lastly. The third, don't even want to think of this, but it's the Dr. Gosnell type of thing where the baby is actively killed. Okay, oh! abort, abort, oh! a fucking oh! abort all abort, over abort, the place. Abort, 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 God damn it. Like there's doctor, okay, first of all, Dr. Gosnell was a monstrous person in Philly. He literally murdered babies. Mm-hmm. And so many of our friends who are abortion providers in that area were seeing patients who had been victims of him when those actual abortion providers went to the state of Pennsylvania and said, this Dr. Gosnell monster is harming patients and we're seeing the ramifications of that. They said it's up to the patients to come and uh, report Dr. Gosnell. And everybody said, please go arrest him. He's a murderer. He's terrible. And I'd like to tell this Kansas representative that he's serving a life sentence for being what, Moji? A murderer. He a murderer. Aside. And also, the I mean, also it's wild even when you think about like <clears throat> providers trying to go and get help. And part of the reason that no one stopped Dr. Gosnell is because he was treating black women and mm-hmm. low income women, and yeah. nobody cares. Nobody cared. And Dr. Gosnell was a political cudgel that the right used. They knew about Dr. Gosnell, and they didn't do anything about it because they wanted to use without saying names 
scary abortion providers that do all this stuff. And it was a mess. And so to recap that people are going to sue for wrongful life, meaning I guess I went into have an abortion and um, I didn't get one. So I'm suing. Not a thing. Not a that thing. people are uh, ripping babies out for abortions and setting them aside, letting them die. Not like a some kind of thing. And then or that Dr. Gosnell kind of behaviors are just allowed and people are walking the earth doing that. Not a thing. I mean, Liz, we don't need born alive acts because if you're born alive and you don't get medical care, that's called infanticide and it's illegal. Yeah, it's murder. And also, this is the thing that gets me constantly, Moji. We hear time and time again from these people who have all these anecdotes that are random about like, they're finding babies that are found at birth and they're just left on trays and left on floors and left here and left there. Why are these people not reporting them to the police, getting these clinics shut down, reporting a hospital or a doctor who's just willy nilly leaving uh, half done abortions or babies to just be die? You know why they're not? Because it's not a thing. But it's a scare tactic that people hear. And when they hear it from somebody who says, I'm a doctor, um, they get really afraid that this is actually how abortion works. And because of abortion stigma, and because we don't talk about how abortion actually works and what abortion actually is, those kind of narratives live in the world. And people are like, yeah, I'm for that. And all that stuff does is harm people who are the victims in our last story of people who are having um, pregnancies that are later in, in later stages where they might need abortions to save their lives. And they're being turned away. And that is a mess. Yes, exactly. And early this summer, we heard harrowing testimony from Texas women during a trial about the ways that abortion bans, the abortion ban there has endangered their lives and created confusion for medical professionals and pain and suffering for patients. The patients won in Texas, but Texas appealed. And so while we're waiting for the final results of that case, a similar class action suit has dropped in Tennessee, Oklahoma, and Idaho. And they are collections of stories. Each of the patient's stories of suffering are chilling. But what's even more inhumane is the blowback from anti-abortion groups diminishing their experiences. And this is, you know, we we see this all over. This is, again, a redux of the Texas. While there are exceptions written into these bans, these exceptions are vague. They're not written in medical language. And the penalties for doctors for violating these bans are particularly harsh. They can include loss of license, expensive fines, even uh, jail time, right? Uh, yeah, and people who are doing abortion care, there are so few doctors that when a doctor is providing this care, they really have to think about, do I want to lose my license? Do we want to lose another doctor? Uh, do I want my malpractice insurance to go up or be un- in- unable to get malpractice insurance? <laughs> like these yeah. are all things that doctors have to take into account. So one of them, actually one that I thought was super interesting was the Oklahoma case is actually a federal case about a woman in Oklahoma is bringing a federal lawsuit against the Oklahoma hospital, a particular Oklahoma hospital, after the doctors told her to wait in the parking lot until she was about to die. Wow. She survived, but she hasn't recovered. Mm-mm. And she's gone through a tubal ligation because she thinks it's too dangerous to become pregnant in Oklahoma. And we've covered individually these stories, and I'm glad that these people are banning together. Uh, We covered extensively the Tennessee woman who discovered at 18 weeks in her pregnancy that her fetus had multiple developmental issues, and she had to start a GoFundMe page to raise over $2,000 to go to New York to have her abortion. And she, she had to she documented it on TikTok. Why should she have to go on TikTok? I was going to say tell people like, about her story. Why can't you just like go and get an abortion? Like the fact that, but of course, when you add in travel and the cost of a later abortion, because again, this was, it was like 20 weeks by the time she made it to New York. These are involved processes and she had to leave state. She had to be alone, you know, like she, and then she had to travel while in recovery. It's really inhumane. Well, and, and the thing that's super inhumane about it is like, 
You look at Texas, the state of Texas doubling down, appealing the ruling from a judge who said, you want to know what? We do need to clarify these laws for doctors so we can save people. And the state of Texas was like, no, no, no. And then Americans United for Life, who often helps write these pieces of legislation, they were quoted as saying, you know, this is exaggerated. I know many pro-life doctors who have never had a problem practicing medicine in these banned states. I'm like, bitch, no one is going to any pro-life doctor. <laughs> if not if a one. terminating the pregnancy is something that they might have to navigate, right? And so to see the rhetoric and to, to have anti-abortion leaders and anti-abortion influencers and lobbyists diminishing these stories. They're not made up. They're very real experiences. And to discount them to me just shows more of that. The cruelty is the point about what they do and just shows that this is not about babies. This is not about life. No wonder they have to rebrand their, their movement as Mm pro-life. Listen to how they're doubling down on, on demanding that nobody saves people when their bodies are, uh, are killing them. And what's really, what's really particularly like jarring about these is a lot of these cases, especially the Texas one, wasn't even, isn't even about overturning the abortion ban. It's just about having clarity of language so that doctors can help people when they come in in pain, when they come in in danger of dying, when they're come in septic, like clarifying the language so that doctors can be like, okay, these are the bounds of the law. And essentially places with these bands are saying, no, 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 we don't want to give you any sort of guideline or map to work in. We just want you to wait for people to die in their cars. In well, the and it will lot. be very interesting to see. Um, it feels like these kind of cases will go to the Supreme Court because it, it clearly states in our constitution that you can't create laws that are vague that will that that can't be interpreted in a reasonable way and testimony after testimony and lawsuit after lawsuit of people running into situations that they can't get care because a doctor is afraid of losing their license or is told to talk to the medical board who has to get permission from the government. Like those things are vague. What is life-saving? What does that entitle? What does that entail rather? I remember this was a year or so ago, a person um, was suffering a miscarriage and they called their politician who had supported an abortion ban and the politician pointed them to a fake clinic. Yes, yes. (laughs) So this is the kind of thing that is mind blowing. And next week, we're going to tell a story of Wyoming and what's going on in Wyoming and how they don't want this kind of testimony to come forth Nope, because um, they're trying to block any kind of testimony that challenges their bans because they know if this stuff's on record, that it becomes very real and they can keep their head in the sand about acting like they didn't know or I don't know and that these bans are just like these blanket ways to save the babies. And it's really all bullshit. So um, we have all these stories in our show notes, of course. Yep. And you can get the best, most up to the minute resources on accessing abortion care and funding your care on our website, aafront.org. Our Charlie chatbot on the bottom right corner will walk anyone anywhere in the country through their options and resources for abortion which is awesome. Go talk to Charlie. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm so excited to get to our guest for today, Liz. Mm -hmm. Our guest today was the executive director of Americans United for Separation of Church and State from 1992 to 2017. He's also an ordained minister and former member of the D.C. Bar Association. His new memoir, Paid to Piss People Off, covers his five decades leading in the fight for free speech and civil liberties. Please welcome Barry Lynn. Hey, Barry. Hello, Barry. Hello there, Emoji. Hello there, Liz. It's been a while since Liz and I have spoken. I know. I'm I'm so excited to talk to you because you have released this like 
tome that of your life, which is super exciting. But first, I want to talk to you, Barry, about the bulk of your career uh, at Americans United for Separation of Church and State, an incredible organization that I want any one of our listeners who don't know about it to learn about it and to people who do know about it to really hear about why this work is so important. To me, separation of church and state is literally the most important American principle. It should be something that conservatives and liberals and progressives and everybody in between supports. But lately, the idea of religious freedom has been completely captured by the religious right, by a majority of the Supreme Court. If you don't keep a decent distance between the institutions of government and those of religion, we are in bad bad shape. And the Supreme Court, thanks to its majority of uh, barely cognizant individuals, <laughs> uh, it's it ain't looking too good right now. No, it isn't. But, you know, it gave me an opportunity to talk to every major religious right figure, to debate them, to do Bill Buckley specials with them. Pa- even Pat Robertson, who rarely att- you know, went on television with anybody. We had a couple of really in- interesting encounters, dozens of encounters with Jerry Falwell. And when people say to me, did these people really believe what they say? I think that generation did. But when you t- look at the right-wing stuff today, like Ben Shapiro. Trash. Trash. Yeah. The guy didn't like the Barbie movie. Yeah, yeah, there seems to be an absolute cynicism to the way that it's deployed. It really does feel like religious, um, religious, not freedom, but sort of the the softening of the lines between religion and our, and our state really has a, an a aggressive quality to it that doesn't seem authentic. No, it, it doesn't. It, I don't think I don't think it is authentic. And I think what hap- has happened is that a lot of politicians are so fearful of offending the religious right, even Democrats, that they don't do the right thing in Congress. They don't they're not tough enough. I mean, I'm still a Democrat, but brother, there are days when I <laughs> wish that there was a viable <laughs> third party in America because these guys just don't fight hard enough. And it, and it's where we're at today is because they don't fight hard enough. You know, when you look at the abortion conversation and the abortion landscape, it's because Democrats thought it was enough to just vote against horrible anti-abortion bills. They weren't forward. They didn't protect reproductive rights. They didn't say the word abortion. They threw us under the bus and they threw trans people under the bus and LGBTQ people under the bus. And it has been this constant with them. And they just rely on us to just vote for them, even though they sell us down the river. Yeah, that's true. And of course, when you look at some of the candidates on the other side, they're so much worse. They're so much more doggedly involved in pressing a religious agenda on everybody. Look, I'm a religious person, but I am not interested in 95% of the positions taken by these appalling people who claim to be Christians and also those who claim to be Christian politicians. It's so funny because I feel like I don't want us to just have a referendum on like Democrats versus Republicans, but it does feel like we don't actually have a choice. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, we can either choose this terrible person who like believes, I don't know, that a, a person who has an abortion should go to jail or be punished, or we get someone who's like, abortion's fine. That's not really choice. (laughs) No, it's not. But I do think that the principle is important. I frankly wish that Roe versus Wade had been decided not on privacy grounds, although I think there's plenty of evidence that that's a good, solid constitutional principle, but that it violates the separation of church and state. So many people in all kinds of traditions, in the Jewish tradition, even in the Catholic tradition, there was no monolithic idea about, oh, abortion, it's always bad under every circumstance. People should be able as individuals to express their own religious beliefs and put those beliefs into practice. And you can't do that if you have a six-week ban on abortion like they're trying to keep up in Florida. 
I love that you brought this up because I really wanted to ask you to weigh in on these cases. You know, one of the ways people, we all have to get creative to fight these abortion bans. And one of the ways in places like Kentucky and Florida is people of faith, people from Jewish traditions, people from non-evangelical Christian, Christian traditions, basically trying to use these uh, religious freedom exceptions to get around abortion ban. Can you weigh in on what you think of the effectiveness of this? Is this sort of like using the master's tools to break down the master's <laughs> house? Yeah, I, I have uh, loved always doing that, using the institutions of government to help destroy the ones that are bad. But I, I think they're very good and very important decisions. What bothers me, even if there are victories, for example, in the trial courts in, in Kentucky and in, in Florida, what will happen when this is appealed to a judicial system which has been totally corrupted by too many ultra conservative judges. And then worse, what if it gets to the United States Supreme Court? This United States Supreme Court claims it's in favor of religious freedom. I don't want to risk that happening when the court decides, well, we, we, we didn't mean that kind of religious freedom. Right. And that's really scary because that's them it. saying your religion you're not free to practice your religion in America. You're only free to practice our religion in America. <laughs> That's exactly the message. I mean, look, the religious right, which I've fought all my life at the ACLU and at Americans United, they have a goal, a set of goals that I think can be roughly summarized by saying they don't want a literate population. They don't want people to think. That's why they're in favor of book censorship. Jerry Falwell, when he decided to merge his religious views with his political ones, said he hoped he would live to see the day when there were no public schools in America because the churches would have taken them all over. Now, if you don't, you don't get that far yet, but you start saying you can't talk about race, you can't talk about sexuality. You can't talk about anything that people could learn to make a difference. The late Phyllis Schlafly and I had a number of big debates. She once said she was against critical thinking, not critical race theory. She was against critical <laughs> thinking. I mean, I mean, you know, it's the kind of thing. She was it, a piece of work. She, I, <laughs> you know, I was having dinner with her once after a show. The, the best thing about television was not what was on the screen, but when you'd sit down with the people you were on with after dinner. And I, so I was with Phyllis at a, at a dinner in Atlanta and I said, Hey, Phyllis, just between us, are there some things that maybe, you know, you should give a little on it? We should open up your thinking about the roles of men and women. And she said, I'd be very dangerous. But there, are, she said, there are some things that you have to keep separate. Men do something and women do something like in the family. And I said, well, give me an example. And she said, taking out the garbage. And I was truly baffled. I said, who's supposed to take out the garbage? And she looked at me like I was an idiot and said, well, the man, of course. I said, why? She said, because there might be animals out by the can. She lived in Alton, Illinois. Raccoons were probably the only animals she came in contact with. It's just, it's so absurd. Also, those animals would probably attack her. Any living, breathing thing. <laughs> I think what I like about the story is at least she was cr against critical thinking for everyone, including herself. You know, it was a blanket, <laughs> yeah. a blanket ban. Yeah, <laughs> uh, she just didn't put it into practice. But one of the things when you confront these people, you find occasionally something you agree with them about. And she was opposed to having a new constitutional convention, as I was until like, few weeks ago and I started to wonder whether this wouldn't maybe be a good idea. She was worried all the liberals would come out and I was worried all the conservatives would come out. The truth is, I hate to say this, but I think progressives often leave the meetings early. You know, they come, they come, they make a speech, then they go home. Conservative, radical conservatives don't do that. They stay till the bitter end and cause as much trouble as humanly possible. And that has been the way always. I've said it time and time again. 
you get one victory if you're progressive and you take vacation for six months and then apparently the issue's over. And like, if anybody's ever worked in local politics, if you have like a precinct caucus or anything like that, the the wildly conservative people will wait it out to get something on the ballot. And then it will be like, they have enough votes to get some wild ass thing going, some some initiative and referendum and it gets on the ballot because everybody left. Yeah. I feel like progressives have never understood civics midterm election. Yeah. I think that's 1000% true when we think about Dobbs. I feel like we, when, when the Supreme Court was debating taking on Dobbs, we as an organization, as Abortion Access Front, were like, oh my goodness, are they going to take it? Or are they going to not? It's the end of row. And I feel like the Alito decision mm. is when all the progressives were like, wait, what? The Alito <laughs> leak exactly. was when it was like the exactly. first time. <laughs> no, and you know, in the history of the abortion issue and the contraceptive issue, which they're clearly going after very soon, Bill Baird was kind of a forgotten hero when he brought the case after there was a decision in Griswold versus Connecticut that married couples could use contraceptives in most states unmarried couples could not and so he was arrested in Massachusetts he went to the Supreme Court in a case called Eisenstadt versus Baird to try to say wait a minute this ought to be available to every woman that wants it Planned Parenthood said that's going too far the ACLU of Massachusetts reneged on their willingness to represent him. He had to get a United States senator to take his case before the United States Supreme Court. The same thing happened with marriage equality. If there hadn't been Evan Wolfson saying, we're going to take the issue of marriage to the court. And a lot of people in the community said, uh, why do you start with that? If he hadn't been forthright about it, we would never have seen it happen. Can you imagine the Obergefell case being taken to this Supreme Court? They're lucky they don't reverse it. It's so true. And Barry, here's the thing. This is Let's get to the book because you've been fighting all of these issues for such a long time. Your book is called Paid to Piss People Off and it's in three parts. Book one is peace, book two is porn, book three is prayer. And I want to first of all talk about how you got the name uh, paid to piss people off. Yeah, I was going to call it Fellowship of the Rings because it's a trilogy, but then some other guy took that one. But <laughs> no, a, a, a high school student came up to me at a party we were having and he said, you know, Mr. Lynn, when I get out of school, I want to do what you do. And I looked at him, I said, Connor, what do you think I do? He said, I think you get paid to piss people off. And I thought that's a pretty darn good title. Yeah, it's also true. I mean, I feel like everybody on this podcast gets exactly. paid to piss people off, which I do enjoy, but it's a little more nuanced than that. And I've known you a long time, Barry, and we've talked about a lot of things. And one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is you know, as we're looking at the evolution, especially when we talk around gender, when we talk around, you know, human sexuality, you know, the sort of at the forefront of sort of this anti-porn feminist movement was Andrea Dworkin, was Cynthia McKinnon. Andrea Dworkin was actually, I had her as a teacher at really? the University of yeah. Professor at the University of Minnesota. Yeah. Um, who taught, you know, any sex that was not initiated by a woman is can, right. should be considered yep. rape. You know, it's yep. very extreme and very anti-sex and very anti-agency over anybody who wants that. And you were fighting and would debate them all the time around around bodily autonomy and that their position was actually not feminist at all. That's correct. I mean, it's not that the feminist anti-porn forces didn't make some good points. They certainly did. But this idea that you kind of, it's a civil rights violation for the existence of sexually explicit material was just crazy. The Mies Commission, which was the other side, they had, a, they had four women on the commission of 11 people. Three of them at the end of the day said, uh, we're not even going to sign on to this because the, the so-called scientific literature that you're using just is ridiculous. It's not it's too flimsy to possibly connect sexual exploitation with uh, pornography or sexual abuse with pornography. I think the most interesting thing about these women, one of them was Ellen Levine, who was at the time the editor of Woman's Day magazine. And one day in Houston, Texas, the 
Ed Meese Commission decided to go on a field trip to porn stores. These are like the sleaziest places you can imagine. Water running over the floor. This could not be mistaken for the adult superstores in some you know, shopping malls where the bright lights, dildos all lined up by color and size. These are sleazy places. And I ended up in a buddy booth, one of these places where two or three people could get in and look a little, check out a little real I'm in it with Ellen Levine and Henry Hudson, who regrettably is now a federal judge, was the head of the uh, Porn Commission. He looks at, we're watching two gay men wearing rubber, green rubber monster masks having sex. So Henry looks at me and he goes, uh, Barry, when you testified before the commission, you said all these images contain ideas. What's the idea of this? I said, uh, Henry, uh, try it. You might like it. <laughs> It's one of my, it was one of my favorite events during the year plus that they were in existence. That was such niche porn. I love hearing that story. <laughs> I like telling it. And I, it has, as Henry Kissinger used to say, the additional advantage of being true. I think we're in a perpetual state of if I don't understand it, it must be wrong, which is the thing that just drives me so wild. But um, before we let you go, Barry... There's so much to talk about with your book. And and I think you just sell your book by being you and telling these stories. And I want everyone to read all three of these books. It just sounds so incredible. But I can't let you go without talking about Rob Shank. For those of you who don't know Rob Shank, um, we at Abortion Access Front, which our listeners do know, is that every year we travel to wherever Operation Save America does their annual conference. And we try to um, counter their messaging with messaging of truth, expose who they are, show people that this is not fringe. This is actually what's happening in America right now. Barry Schenck was part of Operation Rescue. He's somebody who paid off Jane Roe, who was, you know, the Roe v. Wade person um, later to the tune of, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to say that she was no longer for abortion. He and two other buddies uh, chased down Bill Clinton and had threw a fetus at him uh, while he was uh, jogging. Um, and he was literally the foundational part of the anti-abortion movement and now he's repented and i look at him as sort of the lincoln project of anti-abortion <laughs> extremists and you're very good at talking to these people i'm not and i want to be able to trust that somebody has had an awakening i mean he came forward he's yeah. a whistleblower saying that sam alito gave him information on exactly. the hobby lobby case he said a lot of stuff why do you trust this guy? I trust him because I've known him for a very long time. I knew him mainly as an enemy of every good thing you could think of. And in fact, when he asked me to be on a C-SPAN program that he was doing about Bill Clinton's sexual activity with Monica Lewinsky, I, I'm sorry, but I think that was inexcusable. And I think when Hillary Clinton tried to say, oh, uh, she seduced my husband, I think that's baloney. That's that just gross. ridiculous. Yeah, that's but bad. so I appeared. I was the only progressive member of the clergy on this panel of, I don't know, 15 or 20 people. And I did it because you have to tell the truth. And I think that maybe that's the first thing he, he started to think, well, maybe Barry's, maybe I should listen to him. And in fact, he gave me a blurb for this book that says he listened to me for 30 years, mainly as an adversary. But then finally, he said, I realized Barry was more right and I was more wrong. And he said a similar thing on a radio show I did a couple of months ago. People can change. People can see the, the world for what it is, not the world they try to make it. He was in a jail for a night with a woman who had several children who was pregnant and she was crying. And she said, I can't have another child. And I think that person was as instrumental as anyone or anything that I or anybody else said to him to get him to see the truth of how important choice is for a woman's autonomy and for the future. I, one of the greatest things I was asked to do was to, in 2004 to appear at the March for Women's Lives. I followed Hillary Clinton and I said, this was a Sunday event. I said, this is a sacred space here because every child here is a wanted child. And I still believe that. I think you have to take 
You can be anti-abortion for yourself. You can say, I would never have one. But please don't tell everyone else in the country that they should not be allowed to have one. No regulations. Even Roe versus Wade, frankly, a little weak when it comes to third trimester mm -hmm. abortions. And I'll tell you, feminism means is the biggest, the most important way to rethink America in my lifetime. And uh, we can't give it up. We can't go away. We can't have some terrible decisions including at the Supreme Court, and say, I guess it's time to give up. You can never, ever give up on the principles. I think that's right, Barry. And that's why this book about your life is so important, because it shows that these battles have been fought for years. And just, you know, you have to move forward, even when the deaf ears happen, because you're never going to change the minds of politicians unless you change the minds of the people who elect Absolutely. them so that they put the pressure on those people. So that's why we're all here. It's just telling sure. our stories, showing the work. But Barry, if there's one thing you want people to know just about activism, about what's important about the separation of church and state, anything you want to give as parting words of wisdom, what would they be? I think it's this. I started out my life as a very, very shy little boy. And I had a couple of experiences uh, in my earliest years when I, when I saw well, there's something wrong with me. One of them related, I'll just tell you one, it related to William F. Buckley, who was, of course, the great conservative. My father, who I dearly loved, was a big Bill Buckley fan. He was appearing at Lehigh University uh, to debate the founder of the Socialist Party, a man who was really very old and, and really in bad health. I expected to go in there because I was a conservative. I was like Hillary Clinton. I think I had a Goldwater pin. I went there. I listened to this debate. And uh, luckily, all he was talking about was uh, you do it yourself. You, you're, you're one person. You, you don't care about the community. There was nothing I was even learning in Sunday school. And I remember to this day sitting in the, the uh, it was a basketball gym at Lehigh University, sitting unable to get up because I think my whole life has just been changed because I saw in Bill Buckley the fraud that conservatism was for America. And of course, on a little plane trip, 25 years later, when I was doing one of those firing line specials, I had a chance to tell him that story. And I said, you know, Bill, you kind of created me. <laughs> so no matter where you start, you, you practice, you do the things. And if you don't want to get paid to piss people off, you can piss people off for free just by being yourself and speaking the truth to these characters that you may be found around you. Oh my God, Barry Lynn, that is awesome. His new that. book, Paid to Piss People Off. Uh, we're going to get put in our show notes everywhere that you can get the book. Thank you so much, Barry, for joining us. Absolutely, a pleasure to do it. You can purchase Barry's book from Blue Cedar Press. The link is in the show notes. And now the party game that's faster than Monopoly and more fun than taboo. It's Six Degrees of Abortion. This is when Moji takes a story from the news that is seemingly not about abortion. And I have six chances to link it to abortion. Let's see if she can stump me this week. Okay, this one actually was really fun. It made me laugh. It was a headline. The headline is, I'm just going to give you the headline. Florida man arrested while attempting to run across Atlantic Ocean in a giant hamster wheel. And of course, oh. I have to stop and read that because that is wild. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> this man, Reza Ray Bellucci, wa who is an ultra marathon runner, was arrested trying to go from Florida to London in a makeshift human sized hamster wheel in late August. Uh, and this is not his first attempt to cross the Atlantic. Uh, he was rescued by the Coast Guard in a floating hydropod bubble in 2014. He is a fun guy. Reza, the ultra marathon, actually moved here from Iran. Uh, and so I think I'd like you to take a minute to link Iran to abortion. Okay, that's easy. But I want to know what the difference is between a giant human hamster wheel and a giant hydro bubble. I, I feel like they're the same thing. 
even know also they seem like things that you shouldn't use to cross an ocean you know yeah. what i mean it's an ocean yeah. <laughs> i know it's months um i feel like it's wild but okay so tie iran to abortion well nearly two weeks ago i was on the, the podcast of one nagin farsad a fantastic iranian woman who has been on tour with abortion access front who uh is pro-abortion. I was in her documentary called The Muslims Are Coming. Uh, so I'm going to go with Nagin Farsad to advocating for abortion access front by going on the road with us. I think I did it in two. I That might have been one, but it was Maybe great. one. Yeah, it was, that good. was I good. I just mostly needed to talk about this Florida man story because... Poor Reza. Wow. Reza's got a... <laughs> I, I feel like Reza... Also, was was he training for a marathon or something? Was this no? Like... He says he's doing it for peace. Um, there's a whole backstory he has that I don't even fully understand, and it just sounds like a person who is maybe a little bit um delusional. But he does have a website, and we'll just make sure it's in the show notes. <laughs> well, here's the deal: if the dude's in a hamster wheel on the ocean, he's just not causing any wars. He's I can not, tell you that right that's, now. That's what I'm saying. He's not. Yeah, he's not getting in the way. He's no. Not you know getting, what? He's, he's not getting in the way. Himself out of the way. And that's right. I love that for us. That's right. Me too. <laughs> We really love the work that we do here at FBK, and that work is only possible because of the generous support of our fake sponsors. Schools are getting more woke every day, indoctrinating kids with subjects like American history and science. That's why the folks at PragerU have created PragerU. PragerU is the only educational app for parents who don't want their schools teaching their kids about the evils of the joys of sex. With PregerU, we remove the fun and fundamentals of sex education, rooting the classes in our dementals. Sex is evil. Sex is dangerous. Sex is dirty. Save it for the one you love. PregerU's philosophy is blame-centered, helping young girls learn that they're responsible for their own bodies. We want girls to understand consent. Teaching them no means no girl has the authority to say no. And if you ever find yourself with a boy, everything is a yes. And of course, the PragerU videos always stress the cardinal rule of Christian sex. It only happens during marriage. It only happens between a man and a woman. And it only happens when trying to make a baby. Start your PragerU subscription today and get one free month with a discount code no means yes. PragerU. Because your children's sex life begins with you. Creepy. Mm. That's that gave me the ick. It fully yeah, gave me the ick. That's creepy, you know. But it, but you know, I feel like Prager U. They're just doing. Uh, they do the most. And Prager U is doing even more. I know, and I feel like <laughs> half the time when we do these big commercials, that um, they could just be real. It's like, is this satire or is this a thing that we just don't <laughs> haven't dug in the dark web enough to find out whether or not it's real? <laughs> I think we need to end. I feel yeah. like we've run out of words, and yeah, uh, Prager U is kicking us out that is our show that is our show thank you so much to barry lynn for joining us to check about his memoir paid to piss people off you can purchase the books and follow his work online the links in our show notes thank you so much for listening like subscribe and show some love with a five-star rating and stay connected with us on social media at abortion front let's make it different and have some fun doing it Looking for where you might fit in some abortion activism? We've got a five-part activist training series, Operation Save Abortion, at operationsaveabortion.com. And visit our super cool activist calendar, which is full of local and national actions and educational opportunities. One of the featured events coming up on the activist calendar on September 20th from 6 to 8 p.m. Central Time, join Midwest Access Project's workshop on how to support reproductive access for incarcerated and or detained people. Sign up at the link in our show notes or by going to the activist calendar. Next week, the podcast is dark. We are taking a break, but we'll be back on September 29th with comedian, actor, and writer, Danielle Perez, and program manager at the Wild West Access Fund of Nevada, Jess Margarita Tobin. And join our Patreon. You'll support great content and get cool FBK merch and experiences. All pledges support this pod and all of our activism at Abortion Access Front, Pledge at patreon.com slash feminist buzzkills. FBK is edited by Remy de Tournay and is produced by Abortion Access Front. And finally, we leave you with right-wing minister Charlie Shamp, a man showing his whole ass 
when he shares his prophetic vision of the cause of the Maui wildfires. See you in a couple weeks. The islands of Hawaii were the very first state to legalize abortion. And I said, there's an open door in these islands that if it's not closed, I had seen a dragon that was going to come and they, there was going to be uh, an ex, uh, a very um, demonic attack against the islands. And when I had seen it in a vision, it came to me and I saw this dragon literally blowing fire onto the islands. Feminist Buzzkills, the podcast from Abortion Access Front. New episodes drop Friday. When BS is popping, we pop off. And if you want to support our podcast and all the work of Abortion Access Front, like, subscribe, and join our Patreon at patreon.com slash feminist buzzkills.